Welcome to Global Health Impacts of Nanotechnology Law. It's really a thrill and an honor to be at Harvard again. As Phil said in the introduction, we've been planning this since June, and this is the nano lecture series at Harvard and funded in part by the U.S. government, and we are very, very happy to finally have this come to pass. My name is Dr. Elise Fitzsands, and we're going to take an intellectual walk that I think is going to really show you the importance of nanotechnology in shaping the entire society for the future. Uh, these, these just show you uh, my credentials again. As Phil mentioned, there's a lot of them. One of the ones that I'm very proud of is I'm the first ever fellow in international law of nanotechnology at the European Scientific Institute. I think if my mother saw that I'm a fellow, she would be very, very pleased. And also, um, I've done a lot of writing and uh, studying in, in public health as well as nanotechnology. I have the first um, Swiss doctorate in the law of nanotechnology, and I'm very, very pleased to be the author of the book, Global Health Impacts of Nanotechnology Law. So today, we're very briefly going to look at some of the issues that are raised by having nanotechnology in society, but not from the traditional scientific perspective, but how it changes and has pro potentially a very good impact on public health. And this is my contact information, so you're welcome to call me. And um, there's a, a disclosure of potential conflict of interest here, which is that um, I do have a book, and you could buy it, but in fact, it's only a potential conflict because if you contact me directly, I will gladly send you a PDF of the book free of charge. So the first thing I want you to think about is that it, the time has really come to build a bridge between science and law that's more than just science policy, that has some really clear understanding, some communication on both sides of that bridge. This photograph is a, a 3D printed bridge in Shanghai. It's a, it's a bridge that replicates a multi-thousand year old bridge elsewhere. And the people that created this bridge are very proud. They believe they've made it stronger and better. And what's really funny about this picture that you can't see is I gave this talk in Haddonfield, New Jersey, and a kid, you know how kids are, in the middle of the class, the kid shouts out, oh, that's a nanotechnology bridge. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, they haven't perfected the pigments yet. It's definitely nano color. And I said, well, did you do any 3D printing? And he said, of course. And I stupidly raised the question to the other students, I said, well, have you guys, who here has done 3D printing? And they all raised their hands because it's required. And this is a very important point about this bridge, which is that the technology that they were using was not even more than a proof of concept at the time that they were born. And now it's required in the curriculum. So we are seeing things work at a very fast pace, and therefore I have the goals I'm gonna show you in the next slide. So there are really, the objectives here are really very basic. I wanna give you a feel for what's going on in the legal landscape and what's, what's happening with nanotechnology law. What are some of the really big issues that are important? And then, some of the tools that are being used already to make law around nanotechnology try to make sense in what's really a moving target. Nanotechnology is changing so rapidly that a kid in middle school can be using a technology that wasn't even really finalized when they were born. That's a very rapid technological change. So the law is moving rapidly to try and keep pace with that. And then more than anything else, as taxpayers and consumers and uh, I hope voters, um, I want you to be encouraged to participate in this process. And I encourage you to have your say. So like any lawyer, you've got to be wondering, what's this lawyer coming from? What's her perspective? And as a lawyer, I disclose to you my working assumption. 
my working assumption is that nanotechnology is a revolution. I have read that time and again in the literature around nanotechnology, and that's a word that's very, very rarely used in science. It's used a lot in places like France, and they understand revolution, that revolution changes the world, and it doesn't really matter what happened before because revolution makes it new. But for science to say this is a revolution is quite unusual. And there is consensus in the scientific documents that nanotechnology is a revolution and that nanotechnology's revolution is going to change commerce and, and how scientists themselves perceive matter and deal with matter. And I say in my working assumption that nanotechnology's revolution for commerce and science will revolutionize public health. The objective here is to inform you about what's going on in these changes and how you can use tools to participate in these changes. So the, the, the really important point here is to think carefully about what the really big picture looks like, the terrain we've never crossed before. I want you to break out of those silos and think very carefully about what other disciplines are doing at the same time in nanotechnology with clear respect for your own work and for what's going on with what your colleagues are doing. I want you to take an intellectual walk with me in this talk. In this chart, which I want to thank Dr. Mark Hoover of NIOSH for this. We use this throughout my doctoral thesis as a kind of guiding light. In this chart, we see the interaction that's really a creature of the 21st century. And that is, we have the interaction between science and medicine and public health. At the same time, we have new or so-called novel sciences that really behave and bring changes and promises we had only thought about but never really operationalized before. And we have the law. And in the law, I'm very proud to say this is a photograph of the Swiss ambassador in the Palais of Nations. And I took this picture with his permission while he was giving a, a presentation as a delegate. In this particular discipline of looking at global health impacts of nanotechnology, oh, we're looking straight in the middle there at that little tiny intersection of these three very large and very complex circles. So. I want your attention to go right to that center where these things overlap and interact. And it really requires a baseline knowledge of more than one's own discipline in order to really create the policies that are going to be useful and applied in this century. This obviously poses a huge legal dilemma because on the one hand, we want to advance innovation and progress, but we don't want tons of liability. The Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution in 2008 cautioned that it's very easy to do things that are intended to be good, like giving a medicine to pregnant women so they won't be nauseous, and then end up with a huge social problem as that medicine had the unintended consequence of harming babies in utero. And those babies were born, and they were born with defects that society still lives with today. So we don't want to create liability by accident for unforeseen harms that certainly if you could roll back the, the time machine and say to those doctors, you're going to get rid of that nausea, but you know the baby's going to be really sick, most people probably would not have accepted that medicine. But we, it was unforeseen. We didn't know that. So without foresight, it was not possible to pretend, prevent that catastrophe. But at the very same time, we want to be mindful about the importance of public safety and public health. It's a balance. It's a balance that has to be struck. But it's a difficult balance because there are so many unknowns. And yet, the use of the technology is in full swing. That bridge has to be built because we need the information on both sides to be transferred across disciplines. So first, I want to give you an idea of where the law is now. And there's a lot of law here. There's a myth that there's no law of nanotechnology. And even if you just stuck to the sort of basic, old-fashioned 
common law, civil law principles of right and wrong that are codified, you know that there are boundaries. There are places that the law goes very often and that nanotechnology could incur liability or have a limit under law. But actually, we're seeing the emergence of new laws designed exactly to address nanotechnology. I'm not talking about intellectual property law. Um, I will tell you my bias is that intellectual property law has a short-term uh, life ahead of it. It's a very highly paid, highly skilled area of the law. But in fact, we now have several competing patent systems. There's the global system with WIPO. There are major countries that previously did not pay as much attention to patents as they do now that have systems. You have to actually choose which system you want to have your patents. And of course, when it comes to protecting um, original work, is it's not as easy as it was because so much is already known. So much is the product of an international collaboration even using a synchrotron, for example, in Europe is a matter of people from many nations working together. So it's not even clear who really had that original idea that got the patent wheel going. So I don't want to talk about intellectual property. And I also, for that matter, don't really want to talk about regulation in the sense of whether the European Medical Agency or the US Food and Drug Administration or other major agencies approve of what's going on. They have their, their grants of jurisdiction, of course. But the reality is that that's just a baseline floor. That just gives you permission to do stuff. And what we're seeing, especially in Europe, in NanoReg 2 and in the emerging nanotechnology laws like NanoRigo, we're seeing time and again that there's a new paradigm for how we address these issues under law. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about what that new paradigm looks like. I want to be very clear that actually the whole question, should we regulate nanotechnologies, is really, it was debated in the literature, but it's really gone. That's a 10-year-old question. And the, what's coming about instead is, as Dr. John Howard, who's the head of NIOSH, has said many times, these laws are here to stay. And what laws are you talking about, Elise? Well, these laws, there's a list. There's, there's, first of all, every country has some kind of nanotechnology law. If you are here on a grant or through a government authority position that's responsible for dealing with some issue of nanotechnology, there's an underlying statute. But at the same time, there are what we call regional agreements, places like the European Union and the Council of Europe and the Organization of American States and the Organization for African Unity have agreements among countries. And some of these countries don't necessarily like each other, but they understand that they have to work together in order to both extract the level of knowledge that's needed. These, these really require the creativity of great minds from many places, and also the economic reality that globalization means that if you ship from place one where you're manufacturing to place two where there's a user, in between, that product is going to stop somewhere that is not party to that agreement that makes the shipment possible. And their laws may have something to say. So here's a list. You know, the there are international organizations that have treaty-based plenipotentiary authority. There are non-government organizations like ISO, the International Standards Organization. There are individual countries. And there are organizations that are trying to write and think about laws. I think what that all adds up to is that ultimately, we're going to be looking at some system where there will be a global system for nanotechnology law, or as it's called now, nanoregulation. And I want you to think about and keep in your mind this picture on this intellectual walk. And this picture is from my hometown in New York City. And I've actually been in this room, but not at the time the picture was taken. I love this picture because this picture is a very important moment in the life of jurisprudence. This picture is when an idea becomes a law. And the idea was that maybe we ought to do something to protect people with disabilities 
so that they're not subject to discrimination. And you could say, how old is that idea? And how long have people been lobbying for these laws? And I could say to you, mm, well, they started lobbying for the international convention that's pictured here for the voting. They, they started that in the early 21st century. Or I could say, well, actually, it began with the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 taking hold. Or I could say, well, it actually began with global disability community activism in the late 20th century across many countries, or the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Or I could say to you, it actually started at the end of World War I, when veterans were disabled and people felt they were patriots and needed help. You can put that beginning of that idea way back as far as you want, but that stops with this photograph when people vote on that idea and they say there's enough people that agree to that idea that now it's law. And it's the end, it's the finish of the story for the people that were lobbying and cared about whether or not there would be a law. But at the very same time, it's the beginning. It's the birth of a whole apparatus for helping people so that they can be resisting the attempt to discriminate against them and they can be assisted if they perceive themselves as victims and they can get accommodations. So this amazing photograph is the moment when an idea becomes a law. So the idea that we're looking at here is that nanotechnology's revolution for commerce will revolutionize public health that laws are sprouting like mushrooms all over the place. Some may be good and some may be bad and they may conflict with each other and maybe not always the best law wins. But what are we talking about? We're talking about nanotechnology. How big is nano? Well, it was predicted accurately that by 2015, nanotechnology would be over $3 trillion of GDP. And just to give you a perspective of how this really has grown, this is a slide from 2008. And Dr. John Howard gave me the profound honor of coming to the International Labor Organization, where I was serving as the, the coordinator of the International Encyclopedia of Safety and Health. And he gave a marvelous lecture, a really life-transforming lecture called nanotechnology, the newest slice of global economic life. And he gave a two-hour lecture with 66 slides. And at the end, he presented me with a gift of his slides and told me, Elise, if you really want to do anything important or valuable in health, you've got to get out of the system of the bureaucracy and get into school and learn about nanotechnology and study what it's going to do, how it's going to transform society. He was perfectly right. And if you look at this slide, you can see that it's got, for example, cars whose tires and paint and glass coatings were nano and, and clothing with silver nano protecting it against rodents and pests and drugs and cameras where the, the um, the images are transferred using nanotechnology and drug delivery systems that are more intense and more compact. And this slide was 2008. These products were already in commerce. And John said to me, Elise, I have to apologize because this slide is outdated. The things on this slide only reflect a fraction of what's already in the marketplace. And when I look at this slide and I hear junior high school students telling me that they can tell that it's 3D printed because they've been 3D printed, then I know that this slide is really very powerful because this slide is now 12 years old and those children were 13 and 14 years old. And when this slide was made, we didn't know 3D printing would actually work. So here's one of the things that raises a very interesting dilemma that the law will have to grapple with and that society will have to grapple with. I'm sure you've heard of the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris. It's one of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world. And you may know that last year, 
in the spring of 2019, there was a major fire that destroyed the center part of the cathedral. And I happened to have been there afterwards. I didn't make the fire, but I afterwards I photographed the facade, which is still standing. And there's a, a real urgency to uh, reconstruct something so that the facade, facade does not fall. And there in Paris, in Les Halles, was a Lego store with a Lego version of the cathedral. And then right next to it was a discussion in the National Assembly in France about what to do about Notre Dame. And a lot of laws were written very quickly to exclude uh, historic um, protections. And the debate that is part of this intellectual walk is, do we just, because we can 3D print from old wood, wood exactly as it was at the time of, that Notre Dame was constructed, do we just reprint what existed historically? It's not really historic. It's going to use a new technology. Or do we do something completely new that is cognizant of the fact that this old thing is important to us, but isn't really the same anymore. So here you have the, the Lego possibility of reconstructing parts, and at the very same time, the proposal of a nice restaurant on top with a garden and a place to uh, really look out at the city. And just to show you how this new technology is really so very interesting, here's another way that nanotechnology is affecting our daily life. There's a, a laboratory that is taking stem cells from animals and growing them in outer space to make what will be marketed as steaks. And of course, the French say to me, is it tasting any good? Should we eat it? But the reality is that there are a number of bioethical and legal issues. Do we have jurisdiction over what we grow in outer space is the first one, obviously. And if we, if we do, is it going to conform to standards that the European Food Safety Authority or the U.S. Food and Drug Administration will care about or other um, regional organizations may have food standards? It's being marketed as an idea that could save water and energy because one eliminates most of the food chain by growing the cells directly. But does that mean that there are additives or risks we don't know about? Does it mean that, um, that it meets religious standards for people that care about how animals are slaughtered? These are questions that the law on this long intellectual walk are going to have to answer. They're the intersection of those three circles that I showed you in the earlier slide. And that's not to say that this is bad, because we're doing some really, really cool things. So now I want to go to the second part of this idea, which is, what is it exactly that we think the law is going to care about? And how do you do something when you don't necessarily yet have standards? So here, for example, is the um, World Health Organization guidelines on workplace exposure to nanomaterials. I don't expect you to read this and, and memorize it, but it's in the slides because I take the text and you can go back to the talk and you can read it as carefully as you like on pause. There's several very interesting questions raised by this set of guidelines, separate and apart from the issue of what is their meaning because they are guidelines, not law. So first of all, these guidelines have a purpose of trying to really bring some clarity to a field where there's a lot of scientific information floating around at the same time and that there's lots of wonderful inventions we want to get out there. Uh, if we can make steaks in outer space with very little resources, we can feed many hungry people. And we can feed them steak. We don't have to feed them some poor food. And we can possibly enrich it with some vitamins or other things. So the guidelines are an attempt to first start a discourse about what those conditions should look like. And the WHO guidelines, what's so amazing about them, first of all, is this particular set is temporary. The working group of experts understood that they really were not ready to put 
plug in really solid data, that the data is emerging. So they adapted an existing framework for analyzing literature and they created a method for looking at guidelines. And then they said they would have a sunset clause that in 2022, they will revisit these guidelines and make them more appropriate for the context. But for right now, you need a starting point and we don't really know. What's amazing from a legal standpoint, and I won't belabor this, but this is definitely something that we're seeing in a lot of other emerging nanotechnology laws, is that first of all, WHO is doing this without the traditional legal paradigm. The traditional legal paradigm is we have a lot of really sick people, we're not really sure how they got as sick as they are, which factors influence their illness. And then we go back with the law and we try to go from the exposure and draw a direct line. And then to the way that exposure actually was received by those individuals and draw a direct line. And then look at a specific harm or cluster of harms that came from that exposure to those individuals. And then we look at results and outcomes. And with nanotechnology, it's very clear there are no straight lines. First of all, since 2008, we've had things on the marketplace that may or may not interact with the new products that are emerging. And the technology is going so rapidly that a middle school child's lifetime is the lifespan of the change in the technology. So the old rules don't work the same way. So what's really startling is that these WHO guidelines are coming about because of a very clear belief in the need for good solid guidance but in fact there is no empirical straight line that says hey this exposure caused this outcome we don't have the people that are saying they had a particular problem linked to a particular nanotechnology encounter this is very unusual from the point of view of jurisprudence, this is very odd. It's very rare that one addresses an unforeseen harm that you can't even quantify. And yet scientific consensus tells us that precautionary principles, principles apply and that we really need this. So that's the first thing. We don't really have a straight line between exposure and illness, and yet we're making precautionary guidelines. The second thing that's very fascinating is WHO has no enforcement authority and has no budget to inspect people and check on things. So we don't know how or when these guidelines will actually be applied and used. And what's really interesting is they don't really have authority for anything prospective. The, the global assembly, the World Health Assembly, that is a, a meeting of countries every year, has an agenda for safety and health in the workplace. But there is no specific authority for WHO to go into a particular country or factory or check a, a border crossing where materials are being transferred and say, we want to know what's going on. So it's a preemptory strike. And we have never seen a preemptory strike under the law before in this regard. And what this means is that other countries and other regulatory authorities are also looking for this preemptory strike. That this, we know that there's a potential risk that's really great. We know we don't really want to cause harm. And we know we have to think very carefully about what we're doing. So the main thing that the WHO has done here is recommend the use of the global system for harmonization of chemical safety, which is a, a country co by country endorsed treaty system that sets forth the information that must be disclosed from one part of the supply chain to the next, and ancillary information must be given to workers at each step of the supply chain. And it's a very long-standing, beautiful um, set of rules it's not required for nanotechnology, but it is what the guidelines recommend as the first baseline step for compliance with the guidelines. It's the Global Harmonization of Chemical Safety.
They talk about creating protective systems, and they talk about GHS extensively. Of a system of having safety data sheets and annual training and disclosure that Dr. Alice Hamilton herself was actually part of creating what we call in a phrase in the law, the right to know. And the trick with the right to know is that although there's all this obligation to disclose information, danger is not the criterion. You can work with very dangerous stuff and you can work with stuff that has reported health hazards but isn't particularly viewed as very dangerous, as I will show you with REACH and carbon. But the user decides when they pass it to the next part of the supply chain, what information should be available to the next part. And that makes it somewhat self-enforcing in the sense that if you send bad data, people can send it back to you and ask a lot of questions. You don't need an inspector, although you could have one in any number of countries, checking on what you're doing with right to know, when in fact the very next recipient can come back and ask you, what is it that you sent us? And of course, in NIOSH, they have looked at this question with carbon nanotubes since the early part of the 2000s. Here in 2009 was a docket request for information about single and multi-wall carbon nanotubes. And in Europe, we see some really hard and fast law. We see the REACH is the Registration Evaluation Assessment of Chemical Hazards, a very major both trade and public safety tool in regulation. And we used to joke when I started my degree that REACH does not reach nanomaterials. It was written in 2011, and it said that you have to use at least a ton a year of the material before you're regulated. But in fact, this has changed. In the very few weeks ahead, January 2020, REACH will reach nanomaterials, and there are already protocols and systems, and things like carbon, which was considered quite safe. I mean, we, do you remember carbon paper? You wanted to say in a loud voice so they pick it up. What did carbon paper do? It was used for copying. You put the carbon sheet between two pieces of paper in, in your house, in your office, right? Okay, and now carbon, because of carbon nanotubes, is on the reach list. So you can see our notions and governance of what's important and dangerous are rapidly changing. And even when they rewrote the infamous Tosca, which was in the 1970s, the breakthrough notion that a government can regulate in order to try and control toxic substances and was challenged but successfully maintained. It was rewritten just a few years ago. There's President Obama signing off on it. They don't mention nanomaterials, but there are criteria about characterization and toxicity that arguably could apply to nanomaterials. And I've talked to a few of you about EFSA, my new love. The European Food Safety Authority has a 95-page guidance, separate discussion, another lecture, another day. What's the difference between law and guidance? But it's a very important indicator that people are thinking extremely seriously about regulating because the guidance fills the void between the regulation and the real law, and there are various advantages to each. EFSA has a 95-page guidance. Here's just one of the flow charts. There's a bunch of them in there. I don't pretend to understand it. Here, people in this room and listening need to participate. Are these good? Are these useful? Do they make sense? But the nanostructures in food are the subject of the EFSA guidance. And their idea of nanostructures embraces from field to fork, including things that I don't understand, like contact transmission. I don't want to be the person to litigate that definition. And, of course, things that are pretty obvious, like nanopesticide. And just to show you that not only is the EU thinking of this, this is the building in Brussels where they write a lot of EU laws and statutes, and then they send committees around the, the continent in order to think through the details, like the EFSA committees. This very intimidating building is just one of the places, because 
Europe speaks with one voice twice. We have an emerging legal issue because the EU, whether you include Brexit or not, whether Switzerland has agreed and participated voluntarily in a committee or not, for example, they don't participate in the European currency, but do participate in a lot of scientific projects. They actually receive more science into the Swiss than going out for funding, okay? Whatever your definition, it's somewhere between 26 and 28 countries. The Council of Europe has 47 countries. And both of these entities have elected legislatures. And the Council of Europe asked me to write a report for them about what's going on with nanotechnology, balancing the risks and the benefits, because they want to know if they need to start thinking about treaties. And even if they don't precisely regulate, they have a very interesting treaty base to their jurisdiction. They have the Char European Charter of Human Rights, which says health is a human right and which says that individuals can sue their own country. And therefore, it's possible that were a European to take a litigation route, nanotechnology could find itself front and center in the Council of Europe too. Another lecture for another day. So let's move to some basic ideas about policy. We have the beginning of the, the bones from the skeleton are starting to get flesh. People are starting to use the word nanotechnology and regulation. And even when they don't, infrastructures are building around nano enterprises. But so if you're thinking of policy, one of the really big things is to define the issue. A nice scientific way of saying this is does the nature of engineered nanostructural materials and devices present new safety and health risks? And I think everyone that's watching this knows how to deal with that and break that into parts where they can work, whether it's on characterization or it's on um, how the nanoparticles are going to react in the bio-nano interaction. But if you go to a legislature and someone's worried about the price of the toll on the bridge and you want to talk to them about nanotechnology, it's going to be how can the benefits of nanotechnology be enjoyed by society while minimizing the risks? And here are two examples of where the good old scientific definition Oh, you know, it's 100 nanometers or less in one or more dimensions. And if you had a hair, the diameter is 100,000 nanometers. This doesn't help you. Just a few weeks ago in Sweden, they had this beautiful ad for nano. It's a casino. And when I started my doctorate in Switzerland, nanomania was a toy distributed free of charge in the grocery stores and traded on the web. So the question at the time very simply was, is this what you want to regulate or is it something else? Because when you regulate, you have to define the scope of your jurisdiction. And here's a great example. We have a patch. And this patch, theoretically, I haven't tested it or anything, is going to be worn in clothing woven with carbon nanotubes, and be capable of transmitting information. Is this what we want to be included in our definition of nano here? It's sending heart and respiration information. It's sending monitoring to machines that can be stored. Lots of other issues, data privacy and such. But the question here is, these are really cool things. How are we going to make those trade-offs? Where do we want it in this definition of nano that the law will at some point have to grapple with and decide? And here is a graduate of this university. This is also from Sweden. They're really a bit ahead of us, I have to be honest. The, the World Health Organization talked about health and disability when I was starting my doctorate on the World Disability Report. It was the first time that the World Health Organization talked about what disability does in society and what it means and concluded that actually disability is a social construct, not and medical diagnosis, but to the person. Very aligned with the principles in that 
for the disability convention. And here we have a person who is driving a car. It's a driverless car. And this disability activist is deaf and blind and has a seeing eye dog where normally a steering wheel would be. What that means, of course, is that those nano-enabled products that make that car possible are changing our notions and functional abilities of people with disabilities. That lady may be what we call healthy disabled, healthier than someone with a heart condition or diabetes, and yet traditionally you'd say, well, she's not going to drive a car. So we have an expanding scope of what might actually be a disabled person's ability. And at the same time, just yesterday in University of Pennsylvania, they were talking about things that could be done to prevent cancer early on before symptoms. Well, if it's before symptoms, are you required to take that treatment? Is insurance going to cover that treatment? Are you going to be stigmatized as a cancer patient if somebody knows you're getting that treatment? Are you going to get time off from work? These are things that will recur again and again. If they make a cancer vaccine, old issues of vaccination will resurface. And they're not covered by the existing law. So how you define nanotechnology for the purpose of the law is going to shape some of the answers to that question. And lots of people agree that it's really important about definitions, although Andrew Maynard argues against defining nanomaterials for regulatory purposes. And people from the EU argued such a definition is urgently needed, especially for particle nano, particulate nanomaterials. By the way, that was 2011. But Andrew may not be so wrong as you think. Because definitions are important in shaping the contours of the law, but whether you're looking at the, the convention that I showed you in that picture, or you're looking at the Occupational Safety and Health Act of the United States, key concepts are not ordinarily defined. Legislatures duck those problems, and they make compromises. So the Occupational Safety and Health Act, does, it, does that define occupational safety or health? No, no. The disability law doesn't define disability. And how does it get around it? In the old, old days, before the disability law, we had lists. If you have this disease, you're disabled, you get money, protection, care. But those lists are quickly outdated, especially if you have technology that's going to go from proof of concept to actual daily use in schools in less than a decade. Those lists are going to be outdated very quickly. And sometimes they leave out something very important, either because of lobbying or because we didn't know. And sometimes they include things that really don't matter. So if you were going to say nano, are you including the casino? Are you including the toy? Are you including the car named nano? But if you have criteria, if you look at the outcome that's of concern to you, and you look at the results that you do want and the results you do want to avoid, even though that sounds complicated, as my daughter would say, actually, it's flexible. And you can add to it as things organically grow and evolve, because they will either meet the criteria or not. It's rare that well thought out criteria don't work. We have a constitution that's really old. So this is a very important tool. And it's becoming more important. When you look at EFSA, when you look at TSCA, when you look at the various statutes and emerging guidelines that I showed you, they use this flexible idea of criteria. I'll take a second to tell you extremely little, not to tease you, but because it hasn't happened yet. But it's very cool to be part of this. In Europe, they are developing something called NanoRigo, the Nanotechnology Risk Governance Council. And there are lots of really interesting ideas of what to do in case all these questions that I'm throwing at you about nanotechnology suddenly become really important in society. You don't need them all to be important at the same time. You need one or two of them to bubble up to the top and get a lot of currency in media and a lot of attention in a legislature. And suddenly, an unprepared populace will face a crisis for no particularly good reason. So in Europe, the idea is that there should be a place to talk about this. 
And NanoRigo is actually one of three. This is so European. They're going to have not one, but three examples of how to attack the question of a complicated nanotechnology problem that will impact the population and matter under law. And we're going to have the next, I don't know, 40 or so months remaining in this project in order to propose something. And there are two others. They said if it was only one, people would feel it was like they were dictated. They have to take this. If it was two, they'd be polarized. We like this one, not the other. And if it's three, there's a chance that actually some idea will get its point of view out there. But we don't know yet the scope of jurisdiction. Will it arbitrate or adjudicate or write some kind of opinions or be binding or just be an idea and a suggestion? Will it look at claims of harm? We don't know. But again, this is a new paradigm. This is using these flexible criteria and the things that we've seen emerging in the WHO guidelines and the EFSA guidelines, and even the statutes like REACH and TSCA, which are remarkably similar even though they have polar opposite underpinnings. It's a new idea that there's a stepwise approach. You make a test and you get a conclusion. And at the end of that conclusion, if it looks in this range, this is what you do. And if it's in this other range, you do this other thing. Very interesting, the straight line analysis that we've known in the 20th century for thinking about potential harm and liability is becoming less and less useful. The time frame is unknown. The confluence of other exposures is quite great, and we don't know where it'll go. And we also know that if you can make people responsible for their segment, maybe you can make it better for the next person in the next segment. So that's self-enforcing. And the only thing about stepwise that you need to remember is it's not really that simple. You have to step carefully. If you're not honest with yourself as a corporate entity or an employer or someone sending things out into commerce, you will get the wrong answer in your analysis. Nothing here requires people to disclose things to third parties. To disclose it to yourself and probably your insurer, but you need the right result in order to guide what you're doing. And GHS is stepwise in that sense, because it's at each point of that template in the SDS that you have to decide what you have to say that is important for the next person on the list. So the hierarchy of controls that you guys know real well, still very important. Due diligence of how you document systems and survey things. And the questions that we have to ask. How are we going to define nano for the purpose of this problem we want to solve, this legislature? What is a nanoparticle for the purpose of what we're doing here, or under law, or applying risk? And are we going to have strict liability, that old idea, you use it and you blow up somebody, you're completely responsible? Or are we going to have some kind of immunity in there and say, well, the things that you do, they're good for society and we excuse it? We do both of those under law already. Or is it about worker health? And is that consistent with environmental health? These are policy choices where science is a really cool driver. Good data can help people make balanced and fair decisions. And the question of what does government do here? <coughs> I've already shown you that in individual countries and on the EU level, and in the international level, there's a lot of legislative activity. So maybe we'll even have some new international superstructure. And who needs law anyway, right? Couldn't we just go out there without regulation and do what we want? Well, I think that here, nanotechnology is really changing the shape of law. I think governance is going to look very different. More flexible criteria, less straight line analysis, more self-enforcing and reflective work on the part of whoever is using or selling or giving away those nano products. And lots of consensus documents. The key thing about EFSA that's so amazing is the committees of experts that have gotten together to make the various parts of that long document. And again, 
collaboration across countries, across borders, across subjects, countries that don't like each other get together because they want to do something with nano and it's too expensive to do it themselves or too complicated to do by themselves. So in those cases, you find new mixes of people and that means quite a lot less right to intellectual property, something uniquely owned, somebody sitting in a corner coming up with an idea. So what can you do about this? Where's the law going on this bridge that Elise wants you to create and walk across in this intellectual walk in the heart of the confluence of public health and new technologies and law? Well, for one thing, you can come to our Safer Nano in 2020. We're going to have a really great group of people. For another, I want to have um, the creation, and I, I welcome anybody that wants to critique participate in this, of something called Virtual Pen Pals, where research scientists in the field would be paired on the web with students in high school and college around the world, but starting first in the States, and where there can be exchange of ideas on projects and ideas of what to do, and to raise these questions. The important point here is not the answers. This is from uh, Nanotechnology in Greece. We had a marvelous, marvelous group in the University of Aristotle. The point is not what the answers are. The point is the academic important exercise of asking what is going on here? Where is this in society? Where do we want it to go? We can take existing paradigms that we know are bad and wrong, things that cause health disparities, things that are the artifacts of prejudice, and we can rewrite how we do this, because nanotechnology is going to change it anyway, because our understanding of matter is going to change it anyway. So I believe that if we are proactive, we can really enjoy the fruits of how nanotechnology's revolution for commerce can revolutionize public health, and I urge you to join this and enjoy having your say. This is How to Find Me, and that's the book that I am only quasi-profiting from, and I hope you enjoyed my talk. From the people online, any questions, Ma Melanie? No questions. Questions? Uh, from, from the people online, so from the audience. Is there a point you want uh, me to elaborate uh, well, on? Uh, any questions? No. I have, yeah, please. Okay. Can you is can you hear me differently? Okay. I'm Mia Chandler. Um, I'm in the health policy program uh, sponsored by the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. And my thoughts ab around law in general have drastically changed uh, with respect to how I see their function in this. Um, I'm wondering what some of your thoughts are uh, related to behavioral economics. So people have predictable ways of behaving and law can incentivize or disincentivize certain behaviors. You mentioned that it will be less about danger in one of your slides, but what's the alternative and what would you want populations to, to consider? What incentives or disincentives would law uh, provide? If I understand, the question is really what are the behavioral incentives and disincentives in the forthcoming regulations? That's a marvelous question. I, I think it depends, first of all, if you're looking at the people that are manufacturing and using or if you're looking at the consumer end. And in nano, that gets very blurry very fast because you could be a really huge company and you could both consume and send nano products out to commerce. But if you first would have to decide what's that target, what's that result that you want, what's that criterion that's important? Because we do that all the time with law. Law is about creating incentives and disincentives. That's what the tax code does. There was a complaint that the Civil Rights Act was actually um, making moral judgments on society when it was originally passed. But in fact, the funny thing about that was that we were doing that with the tax code all the time. So I think that it's more of a question of which incentives for which purpose. 
It's a legislative question for the particular legislator and for the people here to say, we want this outcome, we don't want this other outcome. For example, if you were to say, um, it would be great if everybody gets the new cancer vaccine that's nano in age. But you're going to raise all those questions around vaccines that ever existed before. Informed consent and is it for herd immunity? Do, are they all really at risk? Are they all so sure of coming down with whatever trajectory that it's worth it to spend the money and the time and make people do this? Or is it a voluntary question? So your incentives and disincentives are going to change depending on your public health purpose and that, of course, in the context of other purposes. But I think that nanotechnology is changing our view of how that dynamic works. And what I have seen time and again as the laws are emerging is that we're coming up with a new paradigm, a new way of approaching problems. We are getting further and further away from that straight line analysis that was all of the common law forever and much of the 20th century, that you have a problem, you think there's this particular solution, and you're going to do it this way. We're seeing more and more that these are multivariate. So that's the thing, is we're going to see a new form of governance. And in the EU, it's very clear because they don't have a written constitution. They have real countries that have a long history of governing themselves and knowing more or less what they're doing in governance with marvelously inbred infrastructures. And they're all trying to harmonize each other and work together. So they're coming up with a whole new approach to how you write laws, how you implement those laws, and how you're accountable for those laws. So I hope that answers your question. It's a very interesting dynamic time to be involved in health policy. It really is. Phil, you had a question. I have a comment and a question. So uh, very interestingly, um, in one of our projects in Singapore, which has to do with nano-enabled food, we're developing approaches uh, to an enhance bioavailability of nutraceuticals and even the other way around, how we can use nanotechnology to reduce uh, uh, unwanted substances in the gut. And as part of that project, we uh, administer a survey, both in Singapore and the US, uh, which, which we run a lot from Harvard and some other colleagues from Singapore, just to, to see the perception of people in, in these two countries. And one of the questions that we're trying to answer is there, is the society wants regulations related to nano and other emerging chemicals and materials? Overwhelmingly, both in Singapore and the U.S., the answer was yes. They want regulations of emerging materials that we know nothing about their environmental health and safety implications. So, so there is a mandate. I, the way I see it, there is this discordance between regulators and, and the society nowadays, and maybe because we had so many crises over the last 20, 30 years, asbestos and PCBs and the like, and people, they don't trust what's out there. I mean, maybe they didn't trust the science, and definitely they don't trust the industry. So but They don't trust their government. Exactly. We're seeing all so, over the world. So, all over the world. So, they, so my, my, my point here, you know, um, the society wants regulations, and what I hear from you, let's um, even redefine uh, how we regulate and, and, and the law yes. for, for all kinds of materials and chemicals. So I want your uh, comment on this. Well, one of the things I looked at in the book is this um, very strange jumbling together of nanotechnology and asbestos. And uh, is nanotechnology the new asbestos? This has been in the press and stuff, and it doesn't fit. I mean, one's a science and one's a substance. And what it forced me to look at, though, was the question of how regulation functions in society. And why do we need them? And uh, are they all really the industries, or are they, in fact, enabling people to do things? Some of it has to do with your point about the incentives and disincentives and what you want to incentivize. But what's really interesting is that we're seeing even companies need some kind of starting point just for something as simple as workplace exposure. So they're not yet comfortable with the idea that a regulator with enforcement and inspection power can come in and tell them what to do with nano. And it's possible the state of the art is not yet progressed to a point where one could have a clear idea of what is really protective and what is 
Ooh, not such a great idea. You can have it at the extremes, but not in the fine tuning of a really good program. The point here is that what we're seeing in the meantime is a lot of guidance growing up. NIOSH, WHO, well-respected places offering ideas because there's this hunger for some kind of rule that you could say told you what to do, guided the starship as it was going across the galaxy. This is very important. I want to be very clear, too. I think John Howard's done a great job in, NI in NIOSH having the recommended exposure limits, but they are not regulations. I have gone to meetings where people have called them regulations, and there's a lot of good reasons that they're not regulations. The point here is people are hungry for something that will tell them what to do. They're not yet comfortable having a, a rule that, for which they could be punished if they violate it. And that will emerge when we know more because the downfall of the guidance is its exact strong point. What's attractive about the guidance is you don't really have to. You do it because you want to and you like it. And it makes sense. And it does provide evidence of due diligence that you tried the best you could with the state of the art. But what a guidance cannot give you that a law does give you is accountability assurance. When you pay your taxes, very few people add an extra hundred bucks to the government because they think it's doing such a good job. And what that means is if you have paid your taxes, they can't come after you and punish you. If it was a guidance, maybe you would do something wrong. You'd forget to pay for something really important. And then when that thing didn't work anymore, they'd say, well, you know, there was nothing here. Fill this void, and so we had this problem. But in fact, if you follow the law, you have a defense when something goes wrong. When you obey the law, you know, if you go through a red light, okay, maybe it's an emergency, and maybe it's really scary late at night, and you're afraid that there's, there's no traffic, but you don't want to be quite in that neighborhood. But if you go through the light with a green light, the law is with you. And if something happens to you, you have a defense. But if it's a guidance, oh, stop at the red light if you feel like it. So you stop or you don't stop, and other things happen. The determination whether that was a good idea or a bad idea because of the accidents that followed is something that's very discretionary and amorphous. So the very thing that they like about guidance is, well, it tells me an idea what to do, but I don't have to do it. The other side is if you don't have to do it, then that means that when you do it, it doesn't protect you in the same way. And what we see with regulation around the world is that people want that comfort zone. The voters and the taxpayers want that comfort zone. What's happening with nanotechnology that's so cool and fascinating is this is unfolding not exactly at the same rate as the technology, but very close in parallel. And that's very cool. And hopefully we'll get some really good regulations out of that. More questions from the audience? Um, hi, my name is Lois Liu. I'm a lawyer working with Brigham and Women's Hospital and I specialize in health privacy projects. So um, my question is, well, you talked about global collaboration in you know, technology and that reminded me of the EU GDPR a couple of years ago. When the GDPR was passed in 2015, none of the U.S. companies, the telemedicine companies, took it seriously. But 2017, when it officially became an effect, it did mention as long as data were collected in Europe, then all the foreign companies have to be in compliance yes, with I, the EU I, law. I'm going to say, I'm going to love this question because I just, <laughs> I, tomorrow in Atlanta, I'm going to talk to a working group on, on AI and data. This is a huge issue in Europe. Yes. Great. Um, so I guess my question is, well, after, after the GDPR and the American companies start to follow that law, and then last year, uh, various multiple states passed their state legislation, California, for example, California Consumers Act, to yes. better regulate data privacy. And that's how we see data privacy, data protection, and telemedicine were regulated across the national borders. And do you see the same, or do you predict the same trend for nanotechnology and legislation? Thank you. Uh, yes and no. Um, and I love the question because I've, I've had to delve into this just for the program that we have for training people 
and, and how to think about lab to market things. GDPR is one of those things that any industry needs to look at regardless what they're doing, regardless how wonderful their creation is for the rest of humanity. And GDPR, however, is an interesting response to a, a perceived crisis, which was people suddenly woke up one day in millions of people at the same time, felt their privacy was intruded upon, and went knocking on the door of their legislators and said, help me, help me. And so GDPR came along. And July 9th, we saw not one but two major enforcement activities in the UK of multi-million pound enforcement against well-established organizations, British Air and Marriott, for breaches of data privacy that were not their fault by their own admission. So when you see a political will, you see a critical mass and things happen. I think what we're seeing with nanotechnology is more evolutionary. We have smart people who say, we don't really know it's dangerous. We have government documents telling us we don't know what to do as a government. We want information and ideas. We know that we're playing with dangerous stuff. So we need to think carefully about how we're doing this. And we have to make a structure where a problem could flow through that structure as it emerges. And people could take their responsibility for their slice of it and not the entire chain. And this is much more evolutionary. This is a new theory of governance. But fortunately, we don't yet have a nanotechnology crisis. I would agree with you that if something horrible happened and nanotechnology was one of the major players in whatever that was, you would see new law very rapidly. And it wouldn't necessarily be the friendly law. It would be the incentive to punish for whatever went wrong at that time. And I think what those of us in the field that are encouraging the regulation to grow, we're hoping that we're actually going to end up with a very nice preventive structure. You know, uh, I always think of the fact that when people don't understand international law and they think it's very far from their life, they don't understand that if you put even a postage stamp, as odd as that is to do, and you mail it to another country, there's a whole bunch of law that tells you how much it should weigh and what that stamp should cost, and then commits people elsewhere who will never meet you to actually handle that mail and deliver it where it's supposed to go. And those are all examples of law, but it's a very quiet background. And I'm hoping that if we really are diligent as a scientific community, we can keep that law in that background. Those letters that get there have important things to say, whether they're love or they're, uh, you know, some terrible news about medical care. But those are letters and they get there. And hopefully Nano will be in that paradigm and not the crisis mode that brought about the GDPR, which is a very important aspect of what's going on in business. Thank you. Join me thanking Elise for the wonderful presentation and giving us the another perspective in our nano lecture series and our risk assessment uh, studies here at the school. So, um, and last but not least, I want to thank Melanie for uh, organizing this uh, event. Oh, she's and production And thank you all for joining us and look forward to seeing you in the next nano lecture series, which is in April 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Elise.